Hi, everybody, and welcome to our virtual exhibition opening of Rethinking Fire. I'm Dana Whitelaw, the Executive Director of the High Desert Museum. So glad you've joined us this evening. And I know we're all a little fatigued with the virtual world, and that makes me extra grateful to have you join us this evening. So thank you. We are here to celebrate the opening of Rethinking Fire, and I'm in the gallery right now. It is truly a stunning exhibition inspired by wildfire and the art and science and history behind it. I was fortunate to see this show back in 2015 in its original form, at the University of Arizona Museum of Art in Tucson. After that, the artist who we're gonna see a little bit later, Brian David Griffith, visited the High Desert Museum to see our gallery and we've been looking forward to and planning for this evening ever since then. When you have the chance to come see it, I promise that the gallery has been transformed into an awe-inspiring experience that provokes wonder and study of fire in our landscape. It is so timely with the fire seasons we've been experiencing, and I invite you to spend time with this art and its profound meaning for our wildland urban interface, prescribed burns in our area, and the catastrophic fire seasons that we've been experiencing. We're going to start this evening's program by hearing from the artist, Brian David Griffith, who created this show, and then move on to some fascinating fire and forest ecology and history with Dr. Andrew Marshall. Before I introduce Brian, I want to thank our amazing staff board and volunteers at the museum that do so much to keep us going every single day, and our wonderful sponsors that have signed on to support this stunning exhibition, Alex Hodge Construction, Cascade a &E, Land Rover Portland, Tonkin Torp, Burnham Crane Services, and the James F. and Marion L. Miller Foundation. We're grateful also for all of our ongoing support of our foundation partners, corporate sponsors, members, and donors during the pandemic. Thank you so much for helping us get through this time. Um, I'm going to share a little bit of background about the artist of Rethinking Fire, Brian David Griffith, experiments with basic tools and materials in painting, photography, sculpture, and installation to pursue work that is simultaneously simple and yet profound. And you're going to see all of those techniques and media in the gallery. His work is held in public collections, including the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, University of Michigan Museum of Art, and Center for Creative Photography in Arizona, among others, and he's exhibited extensively throughout the US. Brian's unconventional career began when he stumbled upon an abandoned copy of Henry Horenstein's Black and White Photography of Basic Manual, and he built a makeshift darkroom while studying engineering at the University of Michigan. He eventually left his engineering career to pursue photography full time, and when Brian's van broke down in Flagstaff, Arizona, he fell in love with that mountain town. In his brief talk, Brian will discuss the fire that threatened his home in 2014 and the project that led to Rethinking Fire. This exhibition debuted at the Mesa Contemporary Arts Museum and was named one of Phoenix's top 10 art events of 2017. We are so excited to have it here for you to see. Here's more from Brian about his solo exhibition, Rethinking Fire at the High Desert Museum. Rethinking Fire started with two phone calls. And the first phone call was from the curator, Sean Scavelin, invited me to join the project Fires of Change, which was sponsored by the Southwest Fire Science Consortium and National Endowment for the Arts, for 10 artists to study wildfire in the field with scientists for a year and develop a group show about that. And not, you know, I think it was two or three days after that, I got the second phone call which is from the Coconino County Sheriff saying, prepare to evacuate because your house is in the path of the slide fire. And I was on the other side of the country. My house is in Arizona in Washington, DC for a show. And all of my work and film archives were back at the house. So I called Sean back um, right after I got that news and said, count me in because I want to be able to do something about this issue, to understand it more and to not feel helpless. And as an artist, one of the greatest sources of inspiration you can ever have is a chance to work on a project that's bigger than yourself. I like my work to, when you, when you encounter the work, you don't see my hand. You don't see how it's made. It seems to just have grown 
in place or maybe be, have been left behind by an ancient culture. Um, that's the kind of work to which I aspire. Now, the reality is there's a lot of engineering and a lot, many, many hours of work that go behind each piece that both me and the staff put in to create that illusion for the viewer. But I want people to walk in and first just marvel at the work and second, then kind of have a sense of mystery of exactly how it's constructed. So my work uses a lot of simple natural materials. Um, it's just, the palette is just black and white, the natural color of wood and leaves. And so finding just the right balance between the materials, between the order and the chaos that's in each piece is essential to making it work. You'll see a lot of circles that are disrupted. Those reference ecological cycles that are disrupted by human activity. Um, you'll see a lot of juxtaposition between these organic forms, natural forms, and geometric man-made forms that you know convey that tension of trying to live with nature. Um, the new piece here, Elegy for 2020, is made specific for, for the High Desert Museum in Oregon. And it uh, incorporates local materials, namely charcoal from the 2020 um, Sanium fire, which burned uh, the town of Detroit, and also local volcanic ash and, uh, and maple leaves from the west side, which are, are charred and each leaf represents a life lost in the 2020 fire season. We live in a fire prone landscape. And so we need to recognize that and learn how to live with fire. Whether that is thinking about how we develop and build in a fire prone landscape, as we've lost farms and ranches in natural areas, open spaces, and put houses right up against the forest, they're more likely to burn. We're never gonna be able to put all fires out. The 20th century was an exceptionally good time for putting fires out. Those conditions have passed. Um, the forests have grown back more thickly. The climate is changing. We're in the midst of a 30-year drought cycle. Um, the fires that we're seeing today are gonna continue to increase in size and severity. So we need to be prepared for that if we want to live in a fire-prone landscape. Yeah, it's been great to work with the museum staff here. Um, they're highly capable and, uh, and wonderful to work with. And we have the ability to fabricate things here on site, which I don't always get, which is great. Uh, for my work in particular, the work is really minimal. It's really simple. But how it's installed in the space, how the viewer moves around it, is very important. A lot of work goes into getting just the right spacing and flow in the exhibition. And so having a staff that can work with me on that, that can fabricate you know, um, barriers or stanchions or shelves that are seven feet instead of the standard eight feet, things like that make quite a bit of difference. And that's wonderful to have that capability here. With Rethinking Fire, um, when I first started working on the, the original group project, Fires of Change, in 2016, I visited Bend and I actually um, proposed that project here in 2016 uh, because I thought it was a great match for the mission of the High Desert Museum, which is focused not just on art, but on the environment, on the science, and deeply rooted in the high desert of Central Oregon a landscape which is fire prone, much like Flagstaff, Arizona, on the other side of the high desert where I'm from in a ponderosa pine forest. So I thought it would be a great match, both for my work and a mission of the museum to do something about this important social and environmental issue. Thank you, Brian, so much for your inspiring work and for bringing it here to the High Desert Museum. We're very grateful. The next part of our program this evening is a fascinating dive into forest ecology, fire, and some history along with that. I'm so pleased to introduce Andrew Marshall, who just received his PhD from Oregon State University in the Department of Forest Ecosystems and Society. 
Andrew is a dendroecologist and uses tree rings to understand how forests influenced, are influenced by climate and disturbance, including wildfire, insects, and disease and forest management. Andrew's research career began in Central Oregon's relatively dry ponderosapine and mixed conifer forests and has now expanded into temperate rainforests in the Western Cascades of Oregon and Washington. He uses tree rings to tell a clear story about how forests develop and change over time. Thank you so much for joining us, Andrew. I'm so excited to hear your talk. Over to you in Corvallis. Well, thank you, Dana, for that introduction. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Well, um, I want to thank everybody for joining me here tonight for this presentation. It's a real treat to be able to describe um, fire and forest development history to this audience that I imagine is very aware of the dry forests in Central Oregon and has a deep uh, investment and interest in them. I titled this presentation, It Didn't Always Burn This Way, um, because I've, I've done three uh, fire and forest development histories in Central Oregon, and this is sort of a, a culmination or summary of some of the major lessons from those different research projects. So I'm going to uh, break tonight's presentation up into four different parts. What I'm going to do is start with uh, background in dendroecology. And so dendroecology is the tool set or the discipline that I'm using to precisely reconstruct historical fires, insects and disease, climate, and how those different things affect how forests develop over time. Uh, in tonight's presentation, I'm mostly going to focus on the aspect of how fire influences forest development and how removing fire has really changed our forests in the past 120 years. The first study that I'm going to discuss uh, will describe the development history in Central Oregon's dry forests, and I'm going to move from sort of the low elevation ponderosa pine dominated forests up to higher elevations where you find uh, Cranford and Douglas fir. After that, I'm going to describe historical fire regimes and these different forest types and how they differ among the forest types, or maybe how they don't differ and how they're similar. Finally, I'm going to wrap up with a discussion of what ecological resistance is in dry forests um, and how it helps these forests persist through things like drought and wildfire, which have always been a part of Central Oregon and which have been, you know, become more frequent with climate change in the, in the coming century. Um, I'm going to finish with a description of the bootleg fire and how it was much different than our historical fires in terms of severity and how that's uh, the result of us losing resistance to disturbance in these forests. So part, part one, uh, this is the background on dendroecology. What I'm doing in this research is I'm using some of the oldest trees on the landscape to learn about forest development and how it's influenced, influenced by disturbances like fire. In these photos, I'm showing you some great examples of old growth ponderosa pine. Ponderosa pine is broadly distributed across the region and it's fantastic for dendroecologists for several reasons. The first is that it's a very long-lived uh, drought and disturbance resistant species, so we can go back five or six hundred years when we want to look at things like climate and disturbance. The other reason it's, it's great is that um, it's very decay resistant, so we have records that last a long time on the landscape. Um, so dendroecology uh, is going to allow me to take each ring in the samples I'm collecting from these trees and date them to their precise year of occurrence. And a lot of people think that as we use tree rings, it's relatively straightforward and we just count backwards in time. But actually, trees often don't uh, contain a ring for every year. They have missing rings, either due to uh, drought or insects and disease. And in many cases, we're using samples from trees that have been dead for decades up to centuries. So we want to make sure that we can take each ring and assign it to its exact year of formation. And what that's going to allow us to do is to calculate things like fire frequency and fire extent more precisely. So we're able to assign tree rings to their exact year of formation using a climate signal that's present in all the trees across Central Oregon. 
And so climate affects the, the width or the amount of growth in each tree ring in our samples. When we have a cool wet year, what we get is a, a large or wide fat ring with dark late wood. And when we have a hot dry year with a lot of drought, what we get are thin skinny rings with thin late wood. And this is basically making a barcode in each tree ring sample. And by precisely matching up that barcode, we can make sure that we're correctly dating all the years in all of our samples. When we do this work, we start with live trees, and so we're going to extract tree cores uh, from the live trees that are plots, and that's going to start moving us from the present back in time. And this is where we start to identify our marker years or signals. And so what I'm showing you in this photo is five tree cores collected from different parts of the region, and you'll see that the arrow points to a very thin and skinny ring. That's the year 1757, and so in 1757, we had a very severe drought, and each time I'm going through a sample and I hit the 1750s, I look for that year and I make sure it's lined up correctly in time. So as we move from our live trees, we go further back, and then we begin to start sampling dead trees. And by lining up that barcode I've been talking about, we can go really far back in time with these records at these sites. It's really important that I'm able to sample dead trees because that's what's giving me the information about fire. Uh, so I'm hunting through these different forest sites for snags, logs, and stumps from trees that have been dead for a long time, and I need to be able to use the barcode to, to, to figure out when they died, when they established, and when they were affected by fire. So uh, ground fires in Central Oregon were historically common and frequent, and we can get evidence of them uh, from fire scars in our old trees. So a surface fire or a ground fire burns the litter and duff, uh, grasses and shrubs in the understory. It doesn't move through the crown, and it often creates a small injury on, at the base of trees. And this injury can be dated to its exact year of formation. So just some examples of me hunting for these fire scars at different places in Central Oregon. Uh, they're quite obvious when you know how to look for them. And so I identify them and then I take sections of these trees with a chainsaw. Here's some examples of that. In this bottom right photo, I'm showing you a sample and they're a little difficult to see, but each one of these vertical lines represents a different fire that this tree reported. Many of the trees in Central Oregon report well over 20 fires during their lifetime. So once we have these samples, we take them back to the lab. They're very carefully glued and sanded and put back together. And then we take them to our measuring station where we measure the annual growth of each of those rings. And what that allows us to do is ensure that our dating is exact and precise, even from a sample that may have been um, collected from a tree that's been dead for a couple hundred years. And so this is what the finished product looks like here. This is a cross section from a stump that I collected west of Bend, Oregon. And what you can see in 1710 is there was a low intensity fire that killed just this part of the tree right here. It killed the cambium. And after that, the live part of the tree started to grow over that wound. And in 1729, another fire came along, found that wound wasn't closed up, and it created another fire. And we can see that repeated in 1751, and these scars were forming on top of an initial fire scar that began all the way back in 1604. So we have these excellent recorder trees, and by sampling many trees at a single sample point, I can get a record of fires from that point. And then by putting multiple points across a large study area or landscape, we can describe the historical flow of fire across that landscape and how it affected different forest types at different rates. So just one quick example of fire and forest development at a typical dry forest site in Central Oregon. Uh, this plot is pictured in the, the photo here. And on the graph, I'm showing you forest development and fire history over time. The x-axis is time, and then each one of these blue lines represents a tree that established in this photo. So this first lower blue line is telling you that a tree established um, in the early 1400s. The black vertical lines are the fires that I was able to reconstruct in the stand. And what you see is this very high frequency of fire and this continuous establishment of trees at a very fine scale over time. So we have trees in this photo that are 600 years old, 
all the way down to somewhere around 100 years old in every age in between. And that diversity in tree ages, diversity in structure in this forest is a function of this frequent and low severity fire. So now that you guys know uh, more about the methods I'm using to reconstruct fire and development history in these forests, I'm going to launch into a brief description of the first study I did in Central Oregon. This research was conducted at uh, quite a few plots across the East Cascades and Ochoco Mountains. The plots are, are, are these dark circles. And the objective of this study was first to inventory current structure and composition in our old growth forests in the region. And this sampling was conducted from forests dominated by ponderosa pine all the way up into forests where grand fir is the predominant species and ponderosa pine becomes quite rare. So in other words, we're moving from the low elevation dry forest to the higher elevation cool and wet forest. So the first result I want to present to you is the diversity in structure and composition across this gradient. The lower elevations, as you might expect, we have forests that are predominantly ponderosa pine in large and small trees. As we move up into high, cool, wet environments, we have ponderosa pine, but now those grand fir and Douglas fir are tall trees and large trees found in the overstory. In between that zone and sort of the intermediate environments, what we find are forests that have large, old-growth ponderosa pine and understories of young trees and smaller trees that are either Douglas fir or grand fir. And I think you're probably noticing that I have names of persistent versus recent, and that's going to go back to the history of how these forests developed over the past 120 years. And so that's what I'm showing you guys on this graph. We have our four different old growth forest types, um, persistent ponderosa pine and persistent shade tolerant, and I'm showing you how these forests developed over time, times the x-axis, and then what I'm showing is the amount of trees established per decade. And tree establishment is color coded by species. So, what you can see prior to 1900 is that most tree establishment was ponderosa pine. What you can also see is that right at about 1900, there's this dramatic increase in the amount of trees that are established each decade. So, we go from very low levels of establishment and survival to suddenly just a big wave of trees coming in. And this wave of trees corresponds to the precise time when we start managing and putting out fire in these landscapes. And so we're increasing the amount of tree establishment and density. Well, what's really interesting is we're also changing forest composition. So this intermediate zone used to be dominated by ponderosa pine, but as we shut off the flow of fire, what you see is this transition to this being either a Granfer dominated forest or a Douglasfer dominated forest. In our persistent shade tolerant type, we do see that there's good evidence that species like Douglas fir and Grand fir have been there prior to, to the exclusion of fire. So that's our forest development history broadly across the region. And next what I'm going to summarize is just some uh, statistics on how forests changed during the 20th century. And I'm going to start this by talking about the total density or stocking of these forests. On this graph here on the left side, I have this broken into relatively dry versus moist forests, and a historical period in rain, and the current conditions in blue. And what I'm trying to show you here is that between the early 1900s and today, tree density uh, more than doubled and in some places actually quadrupled. So we've gone to, to far more trees than we had historically. Another change that's happened at the same time is a dramatic reduction in large trees. So typically in these forests, a large tree is a tree that's over 21 inches in diameter at breast height. And what we've essentially done through selective logging of these trees in the early part of the 20th century to middle 20th century is have their density. So I think the photo in the middle sort of sums up both of these graphs. We used to have forests that were dominated by large, old fire resistant trees we've removed them and we've replaced them with a much higher density of smaller trees that are not fire resistant and they're much less drought resistant. And so that, in this case, is a grand fir that's actually established inside the stump of one of these old ponderous pine that was cut down. So now that we've seen these changes um, in terms of establishment and forest 
uh, conditions. The next step in this research was to really dig into what the historical fire regime was. So, and how it changed across the gradient from our dry ponderosa pine forest into the more moist grand fir dominated forest. So this study was conducted uh, just west of Bend, between Bend and Mount Bachelor. If you're familiar with that drive up to Mount Bachelor, the study area is just south of the highway. It's about 10,000 acres in size, and I had about 100 different plots across the study area that were equally spaced. And so each one of these plots, what I did was reconstruct the record of past fires and the record of, of past tree establishment. Uh, as you might expect, the lower elevations of this study area are more ponderosa pine dominated. And then as we go up higher, we get into our grand fir dominated forest types. And that's just sort of the, the transition or, or layout of different forest types that I sampled there. And each one of these squares um, and circles corresponds to one of my sample points. And so uh, this diversity in contemporary forest conditions is just a function of annual precipitation, as I, as I was sort of alluding to. We start in areas that have 40 centimeters or about 25 inches of precipitation, and in a few short miles, we're all the way up into places that have around 50 inches of precipitation a year. And that's what's driving the transition in forests. Um, a common conception is as we move from this drier part to the wetter part, we should see a really big difference in the historical fire regime. Um, that difference is hypothesized to be a transition from frequent low severity fire to infrequent and high severity fire. But here's what we ended up finding um, in this study. This graph is a little complicated, so I want to take some time with it. Each one of these individual timelines represents a different plot where I reconstructed fire and time is on the x-axis. Each one of these vertical dashes or tick marks represents a fire year. And right here in 1695, you can see that the tick marks all line up. And what that is is a very large fire event that burned across the study area across nearly all of my plots. And you can see that that happened quite often through time. And then there's also quite a few small fires that burn a, a small amount of plots. Um, on this graph, what I've done is I've put all the sites that are ponderosa pine dominated in the hot, dry environment at the bottom, and all the sites that are grand fir dominated in the cool, wet environment at the top. And what you can see is even if you're cool and wet, you had a similar pattern of fire and fire frequency in this landscape historically. So across this broad precipitation gradient, there was frequent low severity fire in our forests in Central Oregon. And so that's a pretty surprising result, um, but when you think about how our climate works annually in a region, it starts to make sense. So despite the fact that it's very cool and this area gets a lot of annual precipitation during our fire season, um, this entire gradient is hot and dry. So as everyone knows from the region, from about the end of May through September, it doesn't matter if you're high up or low down, there's very little precipitation. And that combination of, of reliable summer drought across these different forest types is why they, they burned at very similar frequencies historically. Um, so just one more summary of, of how to look at this data for fire and fire extent in Oregon. Um, this time I'm showing you the number of plots in each year that recorded fire. And you can see the mixture of really large fire events interspersed with smaller fire events over time. I think the other thing I want to point out with this graph is what happens after the year 1900. So we have this really regular pattern of fire and then right about 1910, the flow of fire to this landscape dramatically stops. So most of this area burned at about a 15 year frequency historically, and it hasn't burned since 1910. So we've gone 110 years without fire, and most of this forest were historically burned about every 15 years. Um, summarizing that uh, in another way, it took an average of 19 years for this entire study area to burn prior to 1910. So the next topic I want to describe is what the importance or function of this frequent low severity fire was. And I think to get there, I first need to, to describe to you how these forests were structured. 
And so this is a map of an old growth dry forest that developed with frequent fire. And each of the circles represents a tree in this plot. And so you can see that there's these clumps where tree density is higher, there's individual trees, and there's these openings that were treeless. And what we call this is fine scale heterogeneity. We don't have a homogeneous or even stand. It has skips, gaps, and openings throughout it. And that's a, a function of having this frequent low severity fire as, these, as this force developed. A visualization of this is on the right. Uh, you can see Brent is coring an individual tree that's all by itself. Here he is in a clump of trees, and here's an opening within that same plot. So what's the important, importance of this fine scale heterogeneity in these forests? Um, and I guess what I'm trying to say here is that heterogeneity is why these forests were resistant to fire, but also to things like drought, insects, and disease. So instead of having one homogeneous stand where the trees were all the same size and age class, what we have is lots of different age classes and size classes in forest structures at fine scales. We have our old growth trees, our seedlings and saplings, our snags, and our logs, and our intermediate trees all in one small geography. And this means that um, different insects that target a specific age class or a specific size of tree are never going to be able to completely take out a stand. It also means that we have this variability in fuels. That means when a fire does move through, it's only going to have severe effects in a very small portion of the stand. Um, so because of this, this structure, what we have is tree mortality and establishment also happening at fine scales. Um, and we have many different age classes in these forests historically. I think this is very different from the traditional way people think about fire and forest. The typical model is a forest burns down over a large area, a new stand develops with young trees, and those trees collectively move through the development into an old growth forest. But that's not how our dry forest operated. All of that, all of those dynamics actually happened at, at fine scales within an individual acre historically. Um, so now I'm going to switch to how things have changed in the 20th century in part three of this talk. I'm going to move on to how we've lost resistance uh, during the past 120 years and how that's really changed fire severity over time. And my example today is going to be the Boot Lake Fire. So most people, even nationally, are probably familiar with this fire event. It occurred this summer. It started burning in early July. And by the end of August, it had covered an area of almost 450,000 acres. The really distinct or new thing about this fire in comparison to historical fires is that 60% of it burned at high severity, meaning that all trees over 60% of this fire were killed by it. That's much, much higher than we would have had historically. Historically, we would have saw probably less than 20% mortality in a, in a fire of this size. Um, so how do I know this? How do I know that fire severity has increased? I have to sort of unpack one more set of studies for you. Uh, this is the last fire history reconstruction I did in Central Oregon. And what I wanted to do here was go really big. So my last study was about 10,000 acres in size, and it didn't capture the extent of historical fires. So this one I set up to be 150,000 acres. And my hope was that I'd actually be able to quantify how big fires were historically in Central Oregon. So this is just a much bigger version of the thing I showed you before. It turns out that despite scaling up the sampling, we still had these really, really large fire events that burned across my sample plots and were, were quite extensive. And so th these are just some maps of these historical fires. In 1795, 1829, and 1918, for example, there were fires across this landscape that were well over 100,000 acres. And so in our discipline, we call that a mega, mega fire whenever it exceeds 100,000 acres. And this was a really important finding because we realized that mega fires, in terms of size, have always been a part of the fire regime in Central Oregon. What's really changed is their severity. So just a quick summary here, fires greater than 50,000 acres, which is a really big fire, occurred every, about every 10 years in the study area from 1700 to 1918. Um, 
One point I wanted to highlight for you guys is the conditions under which these fires occurred. Uh, these really large fire events that I reconstructed occurred when PDSI, which is a drought index, was at negative 4.7. And that corresponds to an exceptionally severe drought, like the droughts we've been having in recent decades. And the reason I'm highlighting this to you is because we often hear that the fire severity we're seeing today is, is primarily a function of, of severe drought. And severe drought is definitely a contributor, a contributor, but I want us to keep in mind that our forests have always burned in severe drought in this area, and this isn't necessarily a new thing to happen. What's different is the fire effects. And so now I'm going to move into why the fire effects are different in today's droughts than they were in historical droughts. And so uh, to do this, I need to describe what this forest, uh, where the bootleg fire burned, looked like historically. And we have a fantastic set of records of historical forest conditions uh, from Bureau of Indian BIA inventories across the, the Klamath uh, Reservation in this area that were conducted in the early 1900s. And so this is thousands of acres of forest inventory. And what we see is very low canopy cover across this broad area. Low canopy cover corresponds to a low density forest with very open conditions. You can see that nearly all of this forest had less than 20% canopy cover historically. The next thing I'm gonna show you is the amount of large fire and drought resistant trees that used to make up this forest. And the dark blue here is showing you areas with high densities of these large 21 inch or greater diameter trees. And you can see that across this huge area, most of it had a, a large or dense population of these large trees. It's important for you guys to know that these large trees are anywhere from 200 to 600 years old. And the fact that they're out there, despite the pattern of fire I found, is what tells us that the historical fires were low severity to big trees. They weren't getting killed. They were here on this landscape to fight, despite the fact that it was burning frequently in severe droughts um, historically. So now, uh, another way to, to think about this is just looking at a photo. This is a, an early photo from that same landscape that shows you this open canopy condition low density forest for the majority of the wood volume or basal area in these big trees. This was the predominant condition across the landscape where the Boot Lake fire just burned historically. So now I'm gonna fast forward to how it changed in the 20th century. This time I have our historical conditions on the left side and then conditions in 2017 on the right side. And again, I'm showing you canopy cover. And so we moved from forests that were predominantly open, less than 20% canopy cover, to most of the forests having high canopy cover by uh, 2017. And this is just a dramatic increase in density. Um, so 1920, we had a density average of 28 trees per acre, larger than six inches in diameter. And by 2017, that basically quadrupled to 95 trees per acre. So we ended up with a much more dense forest before the blue light fire. Um, the next, next thing to show you is the loss of large fire resistant trees in these forests. Early 1900s, I already covered this, but large trees that were old were ubiquitous and widespread. Um, they made up, I think, about 86% of the basal area. And for every large tree in this, in this forest, there was basically one small tree. So we had a pretty equal ratio between large and small trees. As we move to 2017, what happens is we lose a lot of our large tree population, and now they only make up 30% of the volume, and nine and 10 trees on this landscape are small trees that are not gonna be resistant to fire and they're densely attacked. Um, so just a photo depiction of this, we're moving from forests that were heterogeneous and resistant to fire to forests that are dense and closed and have this continuous canopy of fuels and a dense accumulation of surface fuels. And the result is that we get large patches of standard placing fire. And I think this photo really captures that condition. Here I'm sampling an old growth tree stump for its fire history. And I'm surrounded by this accumulation of trees from the 20th century and accumulation of deep surface fuels. Um, sampling in the bootleg fire before it burned 
I often found that that litter layer of pine straw um, that it accumulated was, was well over a foot deep, and that's what this, this fire was burning through. So here's the result for the Blue Lake Fire. Um, what you can see is a lot of the, the high basal area mortality. Um, huge areas, thousands of acres burned at high severity in a forest that we're very sure historically had very small patches of, of high severity fire historically. Um, and what I want to highlight here is some of these lower areas of fire severity in the blue. And you can see them in the satellite image in this slide. So this is pre-fire and this is post Lake fire. And right at the center there, you can see some islands of forests that survived. And so now I'm going to key in on those forest islands and talk to you a little bit about why they survived um, on this following slide. So just that time lapse again, before the fire, after the fire, and in the center of that photo, you see some islands of surviving forest. Um, so this map's a little bit hard to see the details on, so I've added them here. But those patches that survived the bootleg fire had recently received thinning and fuels treatments, and that was followed up by prescribed fire. So using uh, what we've learned about the historical densities in this forest and the historical fuel conditions, uh, these forests were restored, fire was reintroduced, and when the bootleg fire came, it burned at low severity or around these patches. So um, clearly, despite the fact that we've had this very severe two decades of drought and the bootleg fire is burning under severe weather, restoring our historical forest conditions successfully provided uh, resistance to that severe fire uh, event, the bootleg fire. Um, just want to finish up my uh, talk today with a, a quick summary of our state of knowledge of historical fire in Ponderosa Pine Forest in the Pacific Northwest. There's actually been a tremendous amount of fire history work. I'm showing you the range of Ponderosa Pine, and each one of these icons is a different uh, fire history reconstruction. You can see that they're well distributed across the area. The right side of this uh, figure shows you the historical fire events. And so again, each one of these tick marks is a fire and each line is a different sample site. So you can see that wherever we had ponderosa pine in the Pacific Northwest, we had a frequent fire regime historically. And then right about 1900, that flow of fire was shut off. So we have this enormous change in forest conditions um, that's decreased resistance to fire moving forward uh, across a huge landscape as our climate's getting hotter and drier. Uh, so final thoughts uh, for tonight. I think our dry forests were much more prepared for the disturbances that are being exacerbated by climate change in 1900 than they, than they are today. In other words, we've been pushing our forests in the wrong direction by moving these lower severity gentle fires out of this system. Putting those fires back in is going to be critical to um, keeping our old forests and our old trees on these landscapes moving forward. Um, we often hear that the change in fire severity and these bigger, meaner fires is the result of drought and climate change. And I think that's correct in the sense that the changing climate is a catalyst for these fires. But um, if you look at how fires used to occur in drought, uh, you see that they weren't always this severe. And so it's, it's really these fuel conditions that have developed over the past 120 years that are increasing uh, the fire severity as we can no longer suppress fires in a hotter and drier climate. Um, I think the importance there is that uh, many of the effects of climate change that are coming our way are unavoidable at this point. But we do still have the opportunity to reintroduce fire as a process that's going to protect our old trees and help us recruit and recover future old growth forests going forward. So not all is lost as we understand what the process and of resistance is and what a resistant forest looks like, uh, we can work to restore that. I think that I went pretty fast here and I'm really happy if anyone wants to follow up and get more details and information uh, or citations about this research in the region. And I think with that, I'll, uh, I'll wrap up and take some questions. Great, thank you so much, Andrew.
Um, we do have time for a couple of questions and a couple are coming through. And as those are um, getting gathered, um, Andrew, I just wanna thank you so much for your talk and research. And it's such a fascinating backdrop for what we have in the gallery for Rethinking Fire. So thank you for bringing us that combination of science along with the art installation. Um, to start off with questions, can you talk a little bit about how these dynamics and this narrative change in different regions of Oregon and the Pacific Northwest? You talked a little bit about the wet and dry sides, but can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure, I'd be happy to. I think that's really important to clarify. Uh, my work and, and similar work in the region has all been conducted in, or applies to Ponderosa Pine Forest that are seasonally dry and, and have low fuel productivity. And so that combination of dryness and lower productivity is what allowed this frequent fire, frequent and low severity fire regime to operate. As we move over to the West Cascades and the wetter forests that are much more productive, they had a very different fire regime, which did include large patches of high severity fire. The higher productivity in those forests means that Doing things like fuels treatments are, is not going to change uh, the outcome for fire in the same way it would on the east side. So you can't apply some of these restorations um, and resistance principles to our wetter forests. Um, in our wetter forests, uh, fire weather is really going to carry the day in terms of how those forests burn. So our, our 2020 uh, west side or Labor Day fires are really driven by east wind events and that's why they're so severe. And that's actually pretty consistent with how they burn historically. Um, I guess as a wrap up, it's really important to know your forest type, its fire history, and apply the, the correct scope of inference for it. So what I showed you today applies to our ponderous pine forest, but it doesn't apply on the west side. Great, thank you. Um, there's another great question coming in. Are there other tree species uh, moving into these areas that you studied, like large tamarack, anything else that changes um, in those study plots? Sure. So the predominantly the species that are moving in or becoming more abundant are Douglas fir and Grand fir. The reason those species are coming in at higher abundance is because they're less resistant to fire as young trees. So historically, that 15-year fire return interval was enough to exclude them. And as we remove that fire, they moved in, and now there's a much larger seed source that, that is progressively shifting these forests from ponderosa pine to grand fir and Douglas fir. In terms of western larch, it's actually going in the opposite direction. So western larch is a very fire resistant species. It does great with fire, but um, it does not do well with competition. So in our more productive forest sites, that's where we find western larch. And removing fire from those productive um, sites was just an invitation for Grand Fur and Douglas Fur to move in, which has really successfully completed with large and removed it out of the system. So we've seen big decreases in species like large and ponderosa pine and big increases in Douglas Fur and Grand Fur. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. Can you talk about um, the other types of disturbance issues that you learn about with tree rings. We talked a lot about fire, but there's other things that impact forests. Sure, I'd be happy to. So there's lots of different insects and pathogens that are specific to different species. Um, a couple of the major ones in Central Oregon are uh, uh, pine beetles and uh, Pandora moth. These are, are, are insects that are specific to ponderosa pine. And when you're going through these samples, you often see the signature, signature of those insects in the tree ring. So, for example, Pandora moth defoliates ponderosa pine and it greatly reduces its growth rate. And I can see that in the tree rings and it'll be consistent across a lot of trees in the sample area. Um, in terms of Grand Fir and Douglas Fir, they have a whole different set of fungal pathogens, uh, beetles and other insects, which um, which feed on them or affect them. And as we move forests to being more dense and more contagious, what that's done is it's allowed those insects and pathogens to move um, and reproduce more quickly and spread more efficiently. 
So if you go back to where I was talking about heterogeneity and those openings in these forests historically, as those have filled in with Douglas fir and Grand fir, the pathogens um, and insects that affect those trees are now more effectively able to move across these forests. So um, it's really changed the disturbance agents that, that kills trees in these forests, we move from fire being the main agent to these insects and pathogens being the main mortality agent. Thank you. And just to follow up on that, is the removal of those low level, low severity fires also um, making the, the insect contagions more virile in those forests? Yeah, so by, by allowing those trees to establish and fill in the forest, you get that connectivity between trees, between their roots that allows that flow of insects and pathogens to increase. So instead of sort of isolated pockets of things like mistletoe or root rot, you now have, have the connectivity that's increased the, um, the prevalence of those, those insects and pathogens. Great, thank you. I think we've got time for one more question. Um, and there was um, an interesting one that came in. Thank you, Rich Winninger. Um, what about fire and lodgepole pine? Sure. Um, Central Oregon has a really interesting and diverse history of, of fire and lodgepole pine. Lodgepole pine is sort of the archetype for it, or the main thought behind how it interacts with fire is fire is infrequent. It burns down all at once and it comes up in an even age span. And that's sort of the, the model for the Rocky Mountains and high elevation forests. In Central Oregon, we have that type of lodgepole pine forest. But we also have lodgepole pine forest that's found at low elevations, um, sort of sandwiched between our ponderosa pine forests. So as you drive to the pine or by Sun River, you'll see these lodgepole pine forests that are surrounded by ponderosa pine. And it's that placement of the lodgepole pine forest in the landscape that means they had a much different or more diverse fire regime in Central Oregon. Fire was moving from those ponderosa pine forests into the lodgepole pine quite frequently. And so we actually have um, a, a mixed severity fire regime in our lodgepole forests where that resulted in, in, in a higher age class diversity and diversity in, in sort of the structure of those lodgepole pine forests that you don't see in the higher ele elevation lodgepole types. Um, sorry, that's a quick summary, but it's a, um, pretty detailed topic. We have, I guess, a, a, a huge diversity of historical fire effects and logical forests in Central Oregon. Andrew, I know I said that was the last question, but I would love to end um, this Q&A with you talking a little bit about some of the work that is being done in forest management collaboratively and you know, applying your work and your science and maybe some of the success stories. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Um, a lot of my work was conducted along with the Deschutes Collaborative Forest Project. And so the DCFP is a, a group that brings together um, government organizations, land managers, uh, forest products industry, recreation, environmental uh, associations, and they meet regularly. And they go through some of the hard topics behind forest restoration, like where to do forest restoration, how much, um, what are the trade-offs for doing different types of forest restoration, how can we make it economically feasible, how can we avoid doing more damage to the landscape in our restoration. And uh, they often need this type of um, ecological framework or understanding to develop their rec recommendations. And so what they do is they actively recruit research that they're a part of, that they help develop, and that helps um, develop sort of a shared understanding of the research and helps them come together and make agreements about forest, re uh, forest restoration. Um, so they're a high functioning group. They have very different perspectives on what they want out of forests in Central Oregon, but they're able to work respectfully and come up with shared agreements and recommendations that they then get to the Forest Service and the Forest Service is able to be more successful in their implementation of restoration and forest management projects.
Great, Andrew, thank you. And thank you so much for spending the evening with us. Um, please come see the exhibit sometime soon. I wanna thank everybody for joining this evening and for being members and please come see us soon. Have a great night. Thanks so much, Andrew. Thanks everyone.